Now, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Protests in Syria have grown steadily over the last three weeks as tens of thousands of Syrians have taken to the streets to protest the 11 year rule of President Bashar al Assad. The Associated Press reports Syrian soldiers on army trucks and jeeps entered the key port city of Banias on Monday, a day after a shootout in which at least four anti-government protesters were killed and dozens of others were wounded. According to Syrian human rights groups, more than 150 people have been killed in the unrest, most shot by Syrian security forces. Many individuals and journalists have also been arrested and unlawfully detained since protests began. As we reported earlier, one of those detained was Egyptian-American engineer Mohammed Radwan. Radwan was arrested in Damascus, Syria, on March 25th, while full photographing anti-regime protests in the city. He was not charged with any crime. Radwan had previously taken part in the pro-democracy uprising in Egypt. He was released last week by Syrian authorities after his family uh, lobbied hard on every front to get him out. We turn now to an exclusive interview with Mohammed Radwan. Democracy Now!'s Anjali Khamet interviewed him shortly after he was released at his family's home in Cairo on April 5th. She filed this report from Egypt. Mohammed Radwan spent one week inside Syria's notorious detention system, four days of which he was held in solitary confinement. Now back at his family home in Cairo, the 32-year-old Egyptian-American engineer says that when he was inside, he had no idea how long his ordeal would last. I started trying to prepare myself mentally for a much longer period. Um, because I was quite aware that uh, of the infamous uh, security uh, forces in Syria. I mean, at this point, no one had told me either if I, I wasn't accused of anything, um, but they weren't giving me any news from the outside world. I was completely cut off. Mohammed was one among hundreds of Syrians and others arrested by the regime in recent weeks. So there was a lot of Arabs there, and they weren't all Syrian. I could tell either by their accents or by the guards um, asking to bring the Iraqi or whoever. Mohammed's friends and family members organized demonstrations outside Syrian embassies in Britain, Egypt, Lebanon, and the United States to secure his release. But inside his cell, Mohammed had no idea that anyone knew what was happening to him. I thought I was going to have to work out getting out on my own. I was still not aware that anyone else, anyone in the world, had any idea about my detention. He explained the series of events leading up to his arrest. On the day of uh, my arrest or detention, I was uh, at the Umayyad Mosque, and it was Friday prayer, and I was sitting within the mosque listening to the sermon and um, at that point I heard a lot of commotion near the back entrance and uh, at one point everyone just got up just stood up um, and started uh, heading towards back to the, to the entrance and automatically everyone just pulled out their phones and started filming I looked around me and there's at least at least 30 different people just with their phones held up directed towards the group at the back who had started to move out to the courtyard. At this point, Muhammad started filming and headed to the courtyard of the mosque. I, um, I took a side and I started tweeting. And I put that, that one jumbled tweet because obviously I was just, uh, I knew uh, it was probably better to get that done with really quick and to continue observing. And it was at that point that um, what seemed like an official walked up to me and asked what I was doing. Uh, he looked like an official because of his really bad suit, but also his attitude, and, uh, and I answered him. I said, I'm, I'm sending out a message, and he asked me to excuse myself and to go with him. And uh, so I ended up following him, and what ended up being, uh, uh, they took me and a few other guys in a vehicle to some location. I'm not sure where that was. And I th this is the location that I spent the following week. Later on that night, uh, they asked me to sit in front of a video camera and uh, discuss some things that, um, regarding uh, my 
presence there in Syria. Um, I mentioned going to Israel, however, that never happened, and uh, taking money for photos also did not happen. This was the so-called confession that was aired on Syrian television. Mohammed explained what he was made to say. Well, I mentioned that I uh, was in contact with um, an individual from uh, Colombia and that eventually I went to Jerusalem and, um, and that I took money for photos. Mohammed says he was not tortured into making the false confession but adds that he didn't really have a choice. It was not uh, an easy situation, and you know, the uncertainty of it all did bring a certain factor of fear into play. Um, and these guys were uh, forceful in their manner, but uh, no, no torture, no abuse or anything like that. I think uh, if you're in there, uh, I mean, you have to do what they say because they have their methods. They, I mean, they're very persuasive people. Ultimately, Mohammed was not charged with any crime and released following sustained pressure from several fronts, including the Egyptian foreign ministry. This, he believes, is one of the tangible changes brought about by the Egyptian uprising. Some of the positive signs is, um, and indications of moving in the right direction is the foreign ministry in Egypt actually going out of its way to help uh, citizens, just one citizen, uh, to help them as much as they could possibly help them. This, uh, we see this as a positive sign. It was not like this uh, a few months ago before the revolution. Mohammed says he wasn't politically active in Syria and still isn't sure why he was targeted. He's worried about those who remain in detention inside Syria, but remains hopeful about what comes next for the Syrian people. I wish my Syrian brothers the best. I hope that uh, in, a, in a democratic world, the majority gets their uh, gets what they want. They live in emergency laws, under emergency law. I mean, emergency laws take away fundamental international human rights. And the current regime is discussing about taking that away. Uh, let's hope they're serious about it. For Democracy Now! I'm Anjali Khamath in Cairo, Egypt.